If you are a self-taught programmer like me, you probably know how to code, but do you know what all of these terms mean? Knowing about the programming terminology will greatly help you to communicate your thoughts with other programmers or teach them. In total, I will cover 50 different programming terms, I have been choosing just the ones that are not too well known, so at the end of the video you can let me know down in the comments how many of them you knew. We will start with the development process and the programming languages. If you are developing an application or some software, the whole development process can be divided into two categories, where the first one is focusing on the backend, which is the server-side part of an application responsible for data processing, some business logic, database management and server configuration. It is what powers the application behind the scenes. On the other hand, front-end is the client-side part of an application responsible for the user interface and user experience. It includes everything the user interacts with directly, from the visual layout to interactivity. And before you start writing the actual code for the application, it might be useful to start with some pseudocode. Pseudocode is a simplified informal way of describing the steps or logic of an algorithm or a program using plain human readable language. It is not written in any specific programming language, but rather in a structured format that resembles code, making it easier to understand the flow of a program without worrying about syntax. Once you are done with the pseudocode, so you have some general layout of how the code is going to look, you are going to be writing the source code, which is the human readable set of instructions written in any programming language like C, C Sharp or Java. This code is what developers write and edit to create software programs. And if you are working on some older project, you will likely be looking at some legacy code, which refers to an older code base or software system that is still in use but may be no longer actively developed or maintained. It often refers to code that was written using outdated technologies or practices. Another type of code that you most likely won't be writing is the binary code, which is the most basic form of computer code consisting entirely of binary digits, so zeros and ones. What is related to the binary code is the machine code. Machine code is the lowest level code that is directly executed by the CPU. It is binary code that represents instructions specific to the architecture of the computer's processor. Another type of code is the executable code, which is the binary code that is generated after source code is compiled. It is the code that the computer's operating system can directly execute. Executable code is typically in the form of a binary file like .exe. Whew, that was a lot of the different code types. Now let's get to the languages. So we have high level languages which are programming languages that are designed to be easy for humans to read and write. They don't require the programmer to manage system resources like memory and CPU directly. Example of a high-level language can be C Sharp, Java or Python. On the other side, we have low-level languages, which are programming languages that provide little or no abstraction from a computer's hardware. They are close to machine code and allow programmers to control hardware directly. These languages are often specific to a particular type of processor or architecture. Example of a low-level language can be assembly language or C. The C language is often considered as a middle-level language, but we'll leave this for later. We can also divide the languages into two more categories. We have interpreted programming languages, which is a type of languages where the code is executed line by line by an interpreter rather than being pre-compiled into machine code. The interpreter reads the source code and directly executes the instructions without converting the entire program into an executable file. Interpreted languages tend to be slower at runtime because of the overhead of interpreting each line of code. An example of interpreted language is Python or JavaScript. And the second category are compiled programming languages, which is a type of languages where the source code is translated into machine code by a compiler before it is executed. Once the source code is compiled, an executable file is created, which can be run directly by the operating system. Compiled languages tend to have faster execution times compared to interpreted languages. An example of a compiled language is C or Rust. And I want to talk about two additional languages or data formats. 
For the first one it's JSON, it's also known as JavaScript Object Notation. It is a lightweight data interchange format that is easy to read and write. It is widely used for storing data or exchanging data between servers and web clients. Then we also have SQL, which stands for Structured Query Language, that is a standardized language for interacting with relational databases. These were only the 14 terms out of 50 that I have prepared. So next, let's get to the terms related to development techniques and tools. Let's take a look at some different programming styles. So first we have the defensive programming, which is a coding practice where developers anticipate potential errors or misuse of the software and write code to handle these scenarios gracefully. It involves writing code that is robust and can handle unexpected inputs, prevent failures and ensure that the software behaves predictably even in cases of invalid data or user errors. This is definitely a useful programming style that I would suggest to all of you. Then we have Extreme Programming, which is an agile software development methodology that encourages releasing new software versions in small and frequent iterations, typically every one or two weeks, and this ensures that customers get working software early and continuously, allowing for rapid feedback and adjustments. We also have Test Driven Programming, or TDD, which is a programming technique where tests are written before the actual code. The process involves writing a test, seeing it fail, then writing the minimum amount of code necessary to pass the test, and finally refactoring the code to meet standards. Another useful programming tactic to reduce the number of the errors and increase your productivity is the pair programming, which involves two programmers working together at the same workstation. One programmer writes the code, while the other reviews each line of code as it is typed. Next, I will mention the two signs of clean code, which are really often mentioned in the book Code Complete 2. The first is encapsulation, which involves bundling data and methods together within a class and restricting access to certain parts of an object to protect its internal state. It is about hiding the data using access modifiers like public and private and providing a controlled interface to interact with the object. The other sign of clean code is abstraction, which focuses on hiding the complexity of an implementation by exposing only the necessary aspects or interfaces. It is about hiding implementation details and allowing users to interact with the system at a higher level without worrying about the underlying complexity. To achieve better abstraction, you should create classes and interfaces with appropriate names. While writing the code, there are more parts to it than just writing it. There is also refactoring, which is the process of restructuring existing code without changing its external behavior. The goal is to improve the internal structure of the code, making it cleaner, easier to understand, maintain and extend. And once you are done with the software you are developing and you are still not satisfied with the performance, you also can do some code tuning, which refers to the process of optimizing code to improve its performance, typically focusing on execution speed or memory usage. Code tuning often results in less readable and maintainable code at the cost of improving speed. It is only recommended to tune your code when you didn't reach your performance goals and performance is critical. It is important that you first profile the software to find the hotspots and only tune those. Let's now talk about some programming tools that you are likely to be using and that will really benefit you. The first are programming patterns, which I'm now learning about. They are also known as design patterns and it is a general reusable solution to a common problem encountered in software design. Design patterns are not finished code, but templates or best practices that can be applied to solve particular types of problems in various programming situations. To speed up the development of the software, you may also find yourself using different libraries. Library is a collection of pre-written code that provides specific functionality reusable in multiple programs. You may also find yourself using frameworks. So framework is a structured environment that dictates the architecture of applications, providing a foundation with built-in features. Next, we have API, also known as Application Programming Interface which connects computers or pieces of software to each other. An API is often made up of different parts 
which act as tools or services that are available to the programmer. One piece of software that you are most likely going to need if you don't want to be coding in Notepad is IDE, this is short for Integrated Development Environment. IDE is a software application that provides comprehensive tools and features to help developers write, test and debug code. Example of an IDE is Visual Studio, PyCharm or Atom. You will also likely need a compiler, which is a program that translates source code written in a high-level programming language, such as c -sharp, into machine code. Compilers are often integrated into IDEs, but can also function independently. And if you are working with a team, you should definitely use some kind of source control, which is also known as version control, and it is a system that manages changes to source code over time. It allows multiple developers to collaborate on a project, track changes, and revert to previous versions of the code if needed. An example of such a system is Git. Git is a version control system, popular due to its flexibility, speed, and powerful branching and merging capabilities. Let's now talk about some additional terms that I could truly not fit into any other category. So if you find yourself creating one class, wanting to test the class, but you realize that in order to test the class, you need to have multiple other classes on which the class is dependent. In this case, you can create a dummy class, which is a minimal or placeholder class used for testing or development purposes. It may have no functionality or only basic methods and its primary purpose is to satisfy the structure of the code during testing or as a placeholder until the actual implementation is completed. Another thing you may be doing without even knowing it is hard coding a value, which refers to the practice of embedding fixed values directly into the source code rather than using variables, constants or configuration files to store these values. What this really is, is that when you write let's say 7 somewhere into your code or use some other magic numbers. This is generally really not a good practice. You may notice that some frameworks or libraries often include a bootstrapper, which is a small program or script that is responsible for initializing and setting up the necessary environment to launch a larger application or system. It ensures that all dependencies and prerequisites are met before the main application starts. Another useful term is a hash, which is a fixed size, numeric or alphanumeric value that represents a larger piece of data. It is the result of applying a hash function to some input data, like a string, file or some other data structure. Hashes are often used to quickly compare large amounts of data or to store and retrieve data efficiently. Hashing is the process of transforming an input into a hash value, typically using a hash function. The hash value is unique for each unique input and the same input will always produce the same hash value, but a small change in input will result in a drastically different hash. Another term that is often thrown around is hash map, which is a data structure that stores key value pairs and uses a hash function to compute an index into an array from which the correct value can be found. The key is hashed to produce a unique index, allowing for efficient data retrieval, insertion and deletion operations. What companies do but developers often don't do are unit tests, which is a type of software testing where individual components or functions of a program called units are tested in isolation from the rest of the application. The goal is to verify that each unit on its own works as expected. Unit tests are often automated to check code functionality continuously. Assertion is a statement used to verify that a certain condition is met during code execution. If the assertion fails, so the condition is false, it raises an error or exception, often stopping program execution. Exception is an event that occurs during the execution of a program that disrupts the normal flow of the code. Exceptions are typically raised when an error occurs, so it can be dividing by zero or accessing a non-existent file. So then the program can either handle the exception, so recover and continue, or terminate. And for the last 11 terms left, I have just some simple basic terms that can be misused. First we have the field, which is a variable declared directly within a class or struct. Second is a property which can provide get and set methods, 
they had wrapped some logic around the field manipulation. For example, when you get the property, you retrieve a value of some variable, but when you want to set it, you do additional null check and execute more logic based on that. Attribute stores the data or state of an object and they are defined by variables within a class. These are also known as fields, properties or instance variables. Expression is a combination of variables, operations and values that are evaluated at runtime to produce another value. Function is a standalone block of code that takes inputs, processes them and returns a value. Method is a function that is associated with an object or a class. It operates on data contained within the object. Procedure is a block of code similar to a function but traditionally does not return a value. It is used in some languages like Pascal, but in modern usage the term is less common. Routine is a general term for any callable block of code, including functions, methods and procedures. Member is any data or behavior defined in a class, struct or interface. Members include fields, properties, methods, events and more. Parameter is a variable in the declaration of a function and argument is the actual value passed to the function when it is called. And this is all for the 50 terms, so let me know down in the comments how many of these you knew. Before recording this video, I knew about most of them, but it really took me some time to put the correct definition and there are some certain nuances that are a bit different for each of the terms. So I hope that now it is clear to you what each of these terms mean, if not, you can watch the video again and go through the different descriptions. This video was a bit different, so again let me know down in the comments if you would want to see more videos like this one. I hope that it was useful, if you have any questions or suggestions, leave them down in the comments and I will see you in next videos. Bye!